Wow, he's a little bigger too. Wow, it's a nice size fish. Let me get him up here. That water is really nice today. So today we're going to be talking about jigging and the bucktail jig in particular. So let's get to it. Now in this video, we're working with the bucktail jig, uh, we're going to be concentrating on ocean, bay, and inlet areas. But any, any of these, what we're talking about, can be applied to river, uh, lake, or stream. So we're going to concentrate on the bucktail jig. And keep in mind, again, this can be applied to any and all types of jigs. Um, we are particularly going to concentrate on uh, a lot of the key points. Uh, we're going to concentrate on how to pick a bucktail jig and how to fish a bucktail jig. But we're going to cover a lot of other things, such as knots, lines, leaders, tying them, uh, different types of jig, where to fish, types of jigs, and whatnot. So there's a lot of material in here. And uh, I, we could have gone on for hours and hours uh, just talking about one of these part particular topics in particular. Uh, but I'm going to concentrate on the aforementioned matter. And uh, let's start talking. Now we're going to start by asking ourselves, what exactly is a bucktail jig? What is a bucktail jig? Well, there's two things I think that makes a bucktail jig a bucktail jig. One is it's a jig. And we're going to talk, get into a second about what is a jig. Well, a jig has uh, basically a, a, a vertical motion, okay? A jig's going to go up and down. So we have the jig part in order. So that's the jig in the bucktail jig. The initial motion's up and down, okay? Although you can swim them horizontally. Now the second part that makes a bucktail jig a bucktail jig is of course the bucktail. And that's as simple as that. We got a vertical jig in motion with a jig tied a bucktail. It's as simple as that. I'm liking that chartreuse, I think. It kind of glows. It kind of glows in the water. Let me... Now, in reference, we're going to talk about other jigs. You can work all these different sizes and shapes of jigs just the same way you work the bucktail jigs we're talking about in this video. Uh, in my mind, I believe that a jig is a jig and they all have a different type of action. They're going to be heavy, light, they're going to have different shapes, styles, but what we're talking about here is no what your jig is going to do when you place it in the water with the tackle you're using. But everything we talk about in this video from ultralight spoons to heavier spoons, um, from heavy sinking minnows, uh, diamond jigs, and of course bucktail jigs can be applied what we talk about in this video. Hard on the grub. As you can see, bucktails come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, you have uh, regular round jig heads, minnow heads, banana heads, uh, cone heads, uh, smiling billies, minnow heads, bean heads, and uh, spot smiling lips again. And there's many, many more. Um, I think this is the shape of your bucktail is going to be the least characteristic you're going to look at. The primary characteristic of your bucktail that you want to pay attention to is going to be your weight. The second characteristic, of course, is going to be the fullness of your bucktail. And the third is going to be your felt trailer that you plan to use with your bucktail. The fullness or the bushiness of, of your bucktail, I will call a secondary characteristic, if not primary characteristic, I'm fishing the same way, uh, is going to be the fullness of your bucktail. Now, in short, the fuller your bucktail, the slower it's going to sink. The thinner your bucktail, the faster it's going to sink. 
of course the style of head is going to influence some action and it's going to influence somewhat how fast that bucktail sinks but the whole idea is you want to control that sink weight by the bucktail that you choose your bucktails i think it's going to be a tertiary uh characteristic um of course you have different colors i like chartreuse whites yellows and say black for night and that's uh i think still the most important characteristic is going to be the weight that you choose and the conditions that you're fishing uh, i would pick the correct weight over a fancy looking color any day but tertiary i will look at the color if i'm fishing say murky water or night i will definitely go with a black a chartreuse or even a yellow um, but the white will work just as well and finally i want to talk about the hook size of your bucktail and you can see this one it's a big giant old goofy hook uh, i would use this probably in the most extreme situations uh, maybe big bluefish big stripers coming abound deeper faster moving water for sure or maybe a fast moving ripping lure action i will go with that bigger hook uh, but in general i'm going to stick in the range of say 30 uh to 50 uh, this one actually is a nice size hook this is that looks like a 60 60 hook but it's a thin light wire hook and it's going to make that sink a little slower you can see this is a really thicker more robust hook that's going to make say that's a two two and a half ounce bucktail that's going to add on a good amount of weight and make that bucktail sink even faster but uh a lot of those fish you can you know just keep in mind the size of your hook and this guy this is about a size 30 hook and this would be good say for fluking or even bigger stripers you throw a little trailer on there uh, but I'm looking at size say 30 40 and maybe that's a little that's about a 70 a little lighter hook somewhere in the middle that could be a 5 -0 hook. So I'm looking, primarily I'm looking about the 3-0 to 5-0 range. Uh, but it all depends on what you're fishing for and how you're fishing. So keep that hook size in mind. Secondary, I would say secondary characteristics when choosing the bucktail jig of your choice. Uh, you're going to alter the action significantly by the trailer you choose. This happens to be a, a, an old worm that I was using. Um, but uh, if you put on a piece of felt as opposed to a worm, pork rind, say otter tail, or anything else, you're going to completely change the profile and action of your lure. You're actually going to beef it up a little, but I think more importantly that trail is going to change its action. It may make it sink faster, it may make it sink slower. So to get a faster action, you can remove the trailers. Some trailers will make them sink faster, uh, but most of them will make them rise. It depends on the size, type, style of trailer. So you can play with your trailers to see how they influence the action of your bucktail. I'm going to start working a bucktail through. I'm going to try a couple different things. Not sure what's going on, but uh, maybe we'll figure something out. That's a chopper. Check him out. That's a beauty. Wow. Whoa, is it? Beautiful hook set. Wow! I'm about to lose my lure. But he's about to chop me off. I don't know. Wow! It's a tremendous blue. Wow! I don't want to get my hand anywhere near this. off. Wow! That's a teener for sure. Holy smackles! That is a big chopper. That is a chopper. Whoa! Beautiful fish. Or to flop. Whoa! The primary thing I think in picking a bucktail is you're going to have to ask yourself where am I going to be fishing? And 
the big question of that is going to be, no matter you're fishing salt water, fresh water is, are you going to be fishing still water? Or are you going to be fishing moving water? Most likely it's going to be something cut in the middle and in between. But that's the big overall picture you have to ask yourself. You could be fishing is a, a ocean, bay, inlet, uh, lake, river. So there's going to be a, a wide range of possibilities. But the first question and the main question to ask yourself is going to be, where am I going to be fishing today? Now you can see here I have six bucktails, but I haven't split up into two sets. The first set here, that is my lighter set. This set I'm going to be fishing in, say, slower moving, uh, calmer water, shallow. And I am going to bring with me three different sizes, and they're going to be 3 eighths, 5 eighths, and 3 quarters. Now, I like the 8 down sizes. Uh, in general, you can work with 1 quarter, it's going to be 1 half, and, well, 3 quarters. That would have been uh, seven, six eighths. But I jump up to three quarters. So in shallower, calmer water, still water situations, I'm going to go with that lighter set. Only because that weight is going to accommodate those conditions better. The second set of bucktail jigs, I'm going to be using in deeper, faster moving water, maybe a more violent ocean surf, uh, maybe a deeper, faster moving inlet, uh, or just deep water in general. But I'm going to work with me, I have them in reverse order, I'm going to bring a one, a one and a half, and about a two ounce jig. And that's going to take cover the spectrum of deeper and faster moving water. On the surf, I generally like to just carry I'll carry a few different sizes. I don't work these exclusively, but I will carry a one ounce and a one and a half ounce uh, in my bag if I am going to be using them on the surf. A uh, swifter, heavier driving surf, you might want to go two, two and a half ounce, but I generally will be throwing different things for that. Uh, in uh, generally calmer waters, um, I like to carry either a five eighth ounce or a half ounce you can use or a three quarter ounce, uh, a Smiling Billy style head and uh, spro style head in the surf. You can use any you know, uh, type of head you want. Now I set up a chart that we're gonna talk about now. Now I'm gonna try to show how I think by using some sort of a graph with bucktails and talking. Uh, on the top here, of course, we have our lighter bucktails and this is shallow water, the shallow water range. As we go down, we get midline and then we get into the deeper water range. In addition, we have still water, absolutely zero uh, current on the left side. And as we go to faster moving water, I'm going to put a Lemus on, an infinitely fast situation on the right. And your depth, if you're shallow, we're working zero. And we're going to go deeper, say to the fathoms where Moby lives. And, uh, so this is what we're going to be looking at here. So in general, what we're looking at here is, this is going to be your still water situation on the left. That's going to be uh, your shallower still water. That could be a pond. Your deeper still water, that could be your lake. Sorry, my penmanship. Good at that. Uh, as you progress to the right, uh, all the way to the right, your shallower, fast moving water, that could be an inlet situation. And maybe as you go down, that could be a deep inlet or a raging, could be up here would be a raging surf. Over here would be a calm surf. As you go to the right, it could be a faster surf. As you go down, that could be, you know, you're getting into 
this is definitely four ounces, eight ounces. You're looking at boat range, ocean, deep ocean. So you get them somewhere in the middle here. This this could be a, a deeper inlet channel somewhere in here. The left up, this could be a river. And if you look at all these, you can see the weights of the bucktail all progressively go up, and they go up high, and then they go up high. So that's how I am trying to think when I choose a bucktail, the weight is going to be your most important thing. And that's going to bring you to where you want to be. Shallow water, and that's like zero ounces, that would say be a fly. And as we go along the diagonal, we're into deep water, and you can see we go from a small quarter ounce, whatever, uh, three-eighths of an ounce, and here we have a two ounce. So the two ounce range would lie somewhere in here, but you get the idea. Now in short, uh, say I was fishing uh, a bay with a slow moving current uh, between the moons. I'm going to be going to maybe start with a quarter ounce. And as the tide starts to rip, I'll go to the five eighths. And generally that'll be enough. As it starts to move a little quicker and I'm in the shallow range, I'm going to be dropping in maybe my three quarter ounce. Bigger than I thought. Wow, that's a, that's a nice blue. What did he spit up? Here, Bunker. About a five, six pounder. Another example would be, say, the ocean, and you're just fine. Um, these will crisscross. You can bring, according to your conditions, three quarter ounce, say, to one and a half ounce, and just keep that in mind. Or you can bring, say, one and a half to two and a half ounces. I rarely go above two, but there are conditions where I will. So you can play with your set of bucktails. So I've been working. This is a one ounce bucktail, and uh, it's an old one, and with a felt chartreuse, probably about five inch trailer, and uh, one ounce. Um, I, you, I like to just, I don't, I don't make uh, the buck any kind of fish in the science. It's a feel, um, but I got one and one and a half, and that one is playing well. It's just kind of wishing around the bottom and you can just let it sit out there and uh but uh, i might try a one and a half a little further out so we'll see now on this end if i'm fishing say a beach i'm going to be looking at the upper end of the chart and this is say if i'm fishing the beach i generally would like to fish even three quarter to say one and a half ounce range I know it's going to be a big surf. I might, you know, work from the one to the two ounce range, even bigger. Um, there was a couple days I didn't have that two and a half ounce that I need. But a slower moving surf, you can definitely throw to three quarter uh, to one ounce. As it starts to raise, well, maybe a bigger surf, you're looking at a one and a half ounce. Of course, it's shallow water. That surf water is going to be shallow. And you can see the bucktails line up, and the most bigger, deeper, faster moving surf. I'm going to go with that two ounce bucket. Definitely that keep up. So to finish up this segment, we find, you can see why weight is the most important factor of your bucktail. Uh, less hair is going to make it sink faster, of course. More hair is going to make it sink slower, but your weight is the primary characteristic you're looking at. And as we saw, 
I like to carry two sets of bucktails, and of course you can mix match your sets and uh, accommodate your fishing from shallow water to deeper water and from still water to fast, situ fast moving situations. Uh, that's general, generally how you're going to be looking. Now we're going to briefly talk about trailers. Uh, I would definitely call this the secondary characteristics of the bucktail. There's a lot of different trailers out there. And uh, if you follow the channel, you know, I generally love and use uh, just a plain homemade. Actually, that is the felt on the bottom that I use for my felt trailers. They really take a beating from any fish. You can customize them. They have go time, quick to make, easy. Uh, I'll do another video on the process if I get the chance. Uh, but this is my chosen trailer. But there's lots of other options out there. And the old traditional one is going to be your, I don't know if you can get this anymore, it's going to be your Uncle Josh pork rind trailer. And this stuff is good because it, ooh, this is an open. This stuff is good because bluefish really can, can, can tear at it a little bit more possibly than the felt. And it'll take a beaten. Um, the old fashioned ones, uh, sometimes you can use uh, worms, your old worms, say from bass fishing, and the back end, or you use the whole thing for a big beefy trailer. Of course, regular curly tailed grubs work great. Um, and more grubs, different color sizes, maybe four inch, uh, six inch trailer. And of course you have uh, a lot of guys out there like to use otter tails. I find these rather pricey, but they are good. And uh, this one has different sizes and shapes in them. And uh, they, they, they pretty withstand a good beat in this here, uh, But the chair, trailer you choose, keep in mind, it'll alter the action of your bucktail somewhat. And know what your trailer does to your bucktail in addition to to making it a longer longer profile. So in addition to uh, maybe slowing down the sink rate, of course you're going to get that longer slinky you know, enticing action. Sometimes if you take off that trailer, you're gonna be into more fish. So keep that in mind too. So I had one fish finally take my teaser. Uh, that's okay, I got some more felt here. Um, what I do is, oh. oh! Might be gone. Oh, I lost my light. All right. No big loss. Um, I, maybe sometime, I know these look like squids, but what I do is, I kind of, I'll make them, I'll set the glue, and when it's dry, I push them together, so they're all kind of balled up. Now, the first way we're going to talk about, about working a bucktail jig, and I think is probably the simplest way, most common way, and most, uh, New anglers uh, will tend to swim the bucktail jig. Now, this is a very effective way to work a bucktail jig. Um, but I'm swimming a, a bucktail jig or any jig in this fashion. When I'm working a jig in this fashion, I'm looking at still water. And I'm looking on the lighter end. Uh, I like that lighter end because it's going to give that bucktail jig a slow, natural drop down to the bottom or wherever you're going to start your swimming action. So I can go from zero ounce, and this would range, a zero ounce would be a fly. Uh, and then, you know, however deep the water, where you want to work that bucktail is, I'll go say, I put a half ounce on my chart here. But uh, generally, swimming a jig, it's a still water condition um, that I'm looking at. Non, very slow moving water. Now, the action is just simple. It's going to be a cast, a simple cast. Okay, this is our fishing rod here, and a retrieve, you know, and you're going to impart action on that bucktail when you retrieve it, and we're going to talk about that in just a second, but we're talking about how to swim a bucktail jig. Oh, 
Okay, I'm going to start here. We're going to talk about swimming with my nice uh, picture here. It's a nice sunny day and we're out fishing. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, something about counting down the bucktail when you cast it. And this is a still water, basically still water situation. That's when I'm going to swim it. So you place your cast where, you know, you're going to actually swing and drop that jig down. And it's going to, you're going to start at some point and you're going to determine when that jig stops, it's going to be about 10 seconds down on the bottom. And you're going to begin your retrieve and it's going to be an up, down, slow motion. You can make it a fast motion and eventually that jig is going to find a fish. He's going to grab it and, uh, you bring them back in and your drops are going to be varied you can see here some are shorter and longer than others you can use your rod tip you can crank that reel in to bring it up and uh, just reel in that fish here and we got one on the board but that's just swimming the jig with some kind of jig in motion again you can use your rod tip I'll show you in a few how we do that or your reel again if you don't want to work on the bottom you think the fish are suspending you know it's 10 feet deep count three seconds and again begin your retrieve but it's a basic up down retrieve as you can see i vary my counts i count in my mind the drop the retrieves and this is just a general swimming action uh, using a countdown method of working a bucktail jig this is probably the simplest way to work a bucktail jig and of course you can always work that jig straight through now we have a scenario here. This is a change of a tide. The water's kind of slow. It is moving water. Uh, we're going to contradict ourselves a lot. But you can see, I'm letting that jig drop. I'm cranking it two times, letting it drop. Cranking it three, four times, letting it drop. And that's how I'm working the bucktail jig in, in this deeper water. Okay, you can see I'm counting in my mind what that jig's doing, how is it dropping. Uh, here's another situation. Uh, of course, this is a beach, but there's pockets of water in the beach that are fairly still. So I take my cast, I'm going to let that jig drop down to the bottom, take a couple cranks. And you can see I'm working that jig with my reel in this video. You can do the same with your rod tip. It's uh, two different ways to work it. But you can see I'm crowning, crank, there I lift my rod tip up. And I'm getting an action out of that too. So keep that in mind. Now I'm going back to my fishing rod and my my reel and I'm going to talk about a second way to work a bucktail jig or any jig uh, in this situation we're going to be fishing a bucktail jig what I like to say belly in the line this is what I do when the water is a very it's got belly you can see you got belly in that line this is what I like to do in a dynamic uh, static -y change in water situation now my left hand here is going to represent external forces. That's going to be the ocean or the currents, the bays. My right hand holding the fishing rod here, this line here with the belly is going to be us working the bucktail. So we're going to be working that bucktail with belly. Now I wrote slack down here. That's what the belly is. It's just slack in your line. When you have that slack in your line, okay, this is the most effective way to work a bucktail. When you have slack in your line, that bucktail is going to have its own natural motion you can see here. Now my left hand is acting like the seas, the great seas in the sky, throwing that bucktail around, do it what it wants. Uh, my right hand is my fishing rod, your fishing rod. Now I'm going to show you what happens when you bring in that slack and you have no more slack in your line. It's almost a fight, uh, an unnatural action with no belly in your line. That, bucktail or any jig you're using is not going to look right to a fish because you don't have that slack and you don't have the water or the wind uh, pushing your bucktail jig around so having that unnatural uh, slack in your line with no belly is very important now i had mentioned something here and i'm going to write it down about static water i mean what i consider static water i'm going to show you a picture it's going to be a very dynamic water where you got all kinds of things going on that's going to toss that jig around um your static water can be anywhere it could be in a surf uh, a rip in an inlet um it's going to be generally moving water and i talked about this earlier um with pockets of water that that are still 
around moving water. It's almost like the water is alive and it has its own imagination. Um, you can still water is going to have this slow moving water uh, anywhere you have a change where two waters meet. It's very you're going to see this static water in inlets, oceans, uh, rivers, um, even streams. It's going to be junctions or changes in the water. But generally, you're looking at where moving waters meet and, and are going to uh, uh, do all kinds of funny things. Um, and this is, again, this is when you're going to fish that belly in a line. I'm going to show you in the next clip a picture of uh, working static water. But we're definitely looking at a moving water situation. We're looking for water that has this static uh, ability uh, when we're going to fish this bucktail with belly. Now here's a live example of uh, what I would consider that staticky water. Um, it's almost like a still pocket out there. So I'm cast out and I let my jig drop. And you can see my rod tips up. And actually there's a nice belly in my line. I don't know if you can see it. And I'm just keeping up with that bucktail until the fish strikes. And uh, you can see I lower my rod tip. And I lower my rod tip because, oh, there we go. I know that... that uh, that jig is just doing what it wants and I'm just maintaining minimal tension if any at all every now and then I make a contact with the line but uh, that's a general uh, one situation uh, working that bucktail and uh, we picked out a striped bass here so let's get him in and I'm going to show you another example where I'm actually holding the rod tip low after we get this fish in rip right here and a high be careful. A hot, nice high rod tip when that washing current comes out. I don't want to see him. When that washing current comes out. Yeah, that's a nice one. Get that washing current, current ripping out. And wow, keeper. That's a keeper. I knew he was a little bit bigger. See if he has it on his own. If not, we'll get him. Next wave. Get himself a drink of water. That's a nice fish. Let's give him a hand. That's definitely the bigger, bigger fish of the day. Ooh. Now here I'm going to show you that slack in my line. If you can look, I'm working that jig parallel, but that I got slack in my line. I'm working with the reel. I'm giving it twitches, but you can see my line there distinctively um, has slack to it. And I know those currents or whatever the heck that water's doing. I don't know. It just changes so much. Uh, I know that jig is working its own. Um, you don't want your jig to drop like a rock. That's just the bottom line. You want that slack in your line, fishing with a belly, when working with a bucktail jig or any jig in particular. But you can see that slack in the line clearly. And we're going to finish off uh, this final segment here about how to work a bucktail jig. Um, now, fishing with a swing. Now, you can do this in any kind of moving water. In static water that we just uh, talked about, you're going to swing that jig as you apply that belly in faster moving water. So this third way is I, I would say you pay attention to your swing a lot more in, in faster moving water. And this is generally going to be uh, 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 we're going to look on the, the, the right side of this chart more slow. Any kind of moving water you're going to be fishing with a swing. And uh, you can see here uh, on our chart is we're going to have a situation you know where it could be a, a creek you know, like a shallow ended creek. And uh, if we move over to the right here, this could be a faster moving, shallower inlet, a deeper inlet, of course. Uh, but this is always going to be a faster moving uh, situation. When you're thinking about swing, again, your, your bigger rivers, etc., uh, even ocean currents, uh, you're going to be, you know, they can, you, we got that big sweep, fishing with a sweep. Um, small streams and brooks. Oh, I broke them on the wrong end of the chart. They should be on the shallow end. But uh, you get the general idea when I'm talking about, when we're going to talk about swing. It's going to be faster moving water. 
and we're fishing with our bucktail jig. Now this, I'm showing you here because we got everything going on. Um, I'm fishing a deeper, uh, a drop off in the channel. My jig's way out there. You can see I'm doing a countdown method. The water's swinging my jig to the left and you can see it's also a staticky water situation. So I'm just kind of letting that jig rise and drop, but it's also being pushed and doing whatever it wants. It's just a, 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 a general, I got my rod tip high, uh, working with the reel, working with, with, with some rod tip, uh, a little bit of everything. And uh, that's what's going on here. And if you pay attention, look where that moon is. And uh, so we're working on a bucktail jig here. We're pretty much so applying any, everything. But we'll, let's talk a little bit more about swing now. So I'm going to work off this little diagram here about fishing with swing. And swing, you put everything all together. And again, we're looking at a faster moving water situation. It could be a slow moving water situation with light jigs. Remember, we talked about picking bucktails. So here's our com current coming in here from left to right. Um, so the current's moving from a left to right direction. Okay. So I would just simply begin by placing a cast just 90 to zero degrees uh, up. And that current's just going to generally just swing your bucktail down. As you're swinging that bucktail, you're going to work it either one of the two methods I mentioned before. Then I'm going to take, might take some few longer casts and never rule out that shorter cast. The way your bucktail acts when you cast, it's going to present itself differently on its swing. So if you cast further and you bring your bucktail back into that second zone, it may not be <clears throat> as effective as your outer zone. You just got to trust me on this. That bucktail is going to work different. It's going to be more effective if those fish are lying closer in and you're getting it in line with them. I'll continue also, I'll start casting another 30 degrees forward and I'll do, you know, whatever action I want on that swing. So the water's kind of going to be pushing that, that bucktail away and you're going to be fishing with belly. You're going to be bringing it in. The water's going to be pushing it. Keep the belly, the slack line, the swing. Everything is working here. Again, I'm going to place my cast another whatever 30, 20, 45 degrees to, over. And you're going to reverse this process if that current's moving the other way. So keep that in mind. It's just amazing. We can go on and on and on about uh, one of these particular topics. But uh, we're going to move on here now and talk about leader. Uh, the leader that I use. I'm looking at, uh, I like a monofilament leader, of course, and I'm going to work with um, Berkeley Big Game or Strand, whatever you, I have, um, from about the 15 pound range. I'm going to use 25 pound and 50 pound, depending on how heavy I'm fishing. I like the 15 pound, of course. You can even use 12 pound with lighter jigs. Uh, 50 pound, 60 pound, It'd be jetty fishing, uh, bigger bluefish, uh, heavier bucktails, long trailers. I remember one time I was fishing 12 inch long strips of uh, bluefish belly with just a, a, a jig head. It was pretty wild fishing with the 50 pound. But I like 15 pound, 25 pound and accommodate the fish I'm going to do that day. That's a nice fish. Let's see if we can get him to cooperate. Get a clear shot. That is definitely a keeper. Spitting out those peanut bunker. That's a nice fish. Get him on his way. I love the way their mouths look when they get big. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Okay, I am using, this is 30 pound braid, and I do have a clip. Um, yeah, actually a bucktail will work better without a clip. And of course the bucktail I talked about, I think it's three quarters, or most one ounce, felt trailer. Probably two and a half, three feet of 30 pound monofilament. So that's about, oh, about a 50 pound barrel swivel. And I think it might be about 40 pound braid. I'm not sure. Let's tell them set up here too. Do keep in mind, like here, this is a high up in the air pier situation. 
Um, I'm going to be fishing a minimal of 30 pound test. I have used 15 no problem with smaller fish like this. But uh, some days if those bigger fish are in, it's just a whole lot easier if you're using 30 pound or even 50 pound test. Keep in mind that heavier line with smaller lure is going to definitely impart some action. Uh, fishing's about a whole big give and take. Let's get this feller on the way and we're going to talk about knots and clips. If I am 100% sure I know what's going on and I'm going to be fishing a bucktail exclusively, I'll always use a knot. And the two general knot types of knots you can use. One is to tie direct like here. Uh, this, I tie direct to my bucktail. You can use a clinch knot, a palma knot, a uh, davy knot, any kind of knot you like to use. Uh, but a lot of people like to use a loop knot and I do use a loop knot time to time. And some people say it gives your bucktail a little more swing. and does it make a difference? I think the size of your leader makes more of a difference than your knot. So uh, use a lighter leader uh, or a, with a lighter bucktail, a heavier leader with a heavier bucktail. Striper. If I can tie direct, that's what I want to do. Um, if time is an issue or if it's cold out, I will definitely use a clip. Just make sure that the clip you choose will fit through your bucktail. I notice the uh, the, uh, these here clips uh, sometimes they get kind of bouncy but I've used regular you know coast lock snaps I've used the clips and uh, they all work uh, just your insurance is you know the primary factor uh, the clip I like to use when it's say colder not sure what's going on I'm throwing other lures changing a lot I'll go with the clip so right now I'm using, this is a one ounce uh, ultra minnow spro style jig head, one ounce um, with a red felt trailer, fairly large trailer, uh, looking for a bigger fish, nice big profile, the water's really ripping in now, coming in, so maybe we'll get something by throwing the bucktail. We picked out there one fish on the bucktail, I haven't seen... I was about to roll out making my speech and we got nailed. That's a nice fish. It's a nice fish. Kind of actually walked away from the crowd just rolling that bucktail through the felt trailer. Hopefully get a good view on him. Come on. He's almost in. I seem to be a little bit out. And I might roll out. Wow. That was wild. Definitely keeper class bass for sure. He ate that bucktail. Nice fish. Nice, nice fish. The other. Definitely keep her class 28 range. Okay, I'm gonna unhook them. They're actually, now is when they're gonna be feeding. Now, I wanna, uh, we're going to briefly mention, I think a secondary characteristic of the bucktail is going to be the line that you're using to present your bucktail. You're going to get a different action out of your bucktail, a different work in action. If you use braid, braided lines, as opposed to uh, a monofilament line. I found when you're working with the monofilament line, uh, it's going to slow the action of your bucktail. You're working with a braid, it's going to cut through the water quicker and your bucktail is going to sink slightly faster. One cool thing with the monofilament line is, and we talked about this, 
is I like to have a slight belly, a slight belly to my bucktail. I know that bucktail's working when I see that belly, and that bucktail's moving and you got that belly going. And the monofilament gives you that action, that presentation, that a lot of other situations the braid doesn't. But you can work with either or. It's just a matter of getting the rhythm and the feeling of what your bucktail's doing, what the line that you have chosen to use. But you can use both. They both work equally well in the end. Definitely a keeper fluke. Oh my goodness. Now, one thing I want to talk about in this segment briefly is your bucktails you can retie and they last a long time if you do that. Uh, generally, I talk about a full bushy tail as opposed to, say, a medium and a sparse bucktail. That's a little sparse. And this one's a bit full, different actions. What I like to do is, when I'm tying the bucktail, is I will generally make them very bushy. And as I use that bucktail, it'll go from bushy to medium and eventually go to sparse until you get down to where you have nothing but a jig head and a hook. And that'll work too. I have caught fish like that. And I will repeat the process all over again. So uh, generally, that's how I will retie my bucktails in that fashion. Grab a bucktail. Ooh, that's a nicer fish. That's a keeper. I know there's a couple keepers mixed in. He looks like he's in there. Got a, he's one of the long, skinny ones. Get close. And he chased that there buck. The bucktail, bucktail. Working that in the bucktail teaser. That's wild. He looks like a close to a keep. Yeah, he's a keeper size fish. He's got to be close to 28. They're definitely in there. Yeah, he's longer than my arm. He's got to be. Let me get him on his way. So I am, I am just working through with the bucktail and the bucktail teaser right now. Uh, looking for striped bass. We got a friend out there. There's a bird. It looks like he's hunting. To finish off, I would like to thank you for watching. But like to finish off, uh, I don't think we mentioned the teaser. And a bucktail jig can most certainly be worked with a teaser. So I'm going to leave you with this. I think I do enough teaser oh, talk. But uh, you can also work that bucktail jig with a teaser. Um, if those fish are thick, you're really going to rake them in. If they're thin, it's a great way to see where they're lying and uh, oh, what they're doing. And sometimes you're going to just pick them out more so with that teaser. So on this thought, I'm going to finish up my fishing. And uh, thank you for watching. Uh, please like, dislike, comment, subscribe to the channel or not. And always remember, fish your way. And have a good afternoon, night, day, or evening, wherever you are. That's a nice fish too. These are different fish than when we first started. That's one. I'm sure that they're getting them all.